You're listening to the Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. Hey guys, you're listening to episode 149 of The Modern Acre, presented by Farm Together. Farm Together is a technology-enabled farmland investment platform that provides accredited investors with direct access to farmland as an asset class. With Farm Together, investors have access to institutional quality farmland online in just minutes. That's www.farmtogether.com, where investing in farmland has never been so easy. Become a farmland investor in minutes and watch your money grow today. Have you guys checked out Farm Together yet? I feel like you need to do it. The year's almost up. You know, thinking about future finances, investments, a lot is uncertain. You need to diversify and invest in some farmland. That is some stellar advice, Ty. I like that. Good way to finish the year. Get your get your portfolio right. But to be clear, Tim and I are not financial advisors, so uh, legal legal disclaimer there. Exactly. Yeah. Don't uh, don't read too much into that. <laughs> so take our advice, but don't take our advice. But definitely check out farmtogether.com. So Ty, we're we're midway in December here. We're wrapping up a lot of things. Still full bore at the farm. It's pretty crazy. We haven't had any rains. To, we're still going flat out. Definitely crazy times at the farm. Um, pretty excited about continuing to get ready for our pasture bird partnership. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week on Hint Hint episode 150, uh, which is going to be a crazy milestone for us. But Tim, um, it feels like you may have been slacking in, in getting us some new guests. What's the deal? Yeah, so we ran into some scheduling difficulty last week, 2020 problems, scheduling, schedule changes. So uh, missed our interview this week, so we're actually going to have to do a re-air. But it's it's 2020 ties, so we got to take it a little bit easier on ourselves. Yeah, I feel like we're just taking an L, taking it on the chin. Um, but the good news for you guys is that we're re-airing one of our most popular episodes uh, to date, and that is with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Gabe Brown. Yeah, this is a super fun episode. We had Gabe on early this year, just talked through his story, talked about how he's thinking about the the movement that's happening in regenerative right now. So still very applicable. Ty and I talk a lot about regenerative on the podcast, and it's always good hearing from the the godfather of the space. Yeah, he probably uh, wouldn't even take that title himself, but we just get into his background, his story, which if you if you don't know Gabe's story, it, it's super compelling and, and really how um, he has been a pillar for, for the regenerative agriculture movement and really the first big case study in how to implement regenerative at scale. And so I uh, really encourage you guys, if, if you missed this episode, tune in because you don't want to miss um, everything that Gabe had to offer in this episode. Let's jump in. Hi, Gabe. Welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Gabe, you were talking to us a little bit earlier about large ag and how they've almost painted themselves in a corner and they're almost so big now where it's harder to pivot into regenerative agriculture. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. So one of the things uh, my business partners and I are really focusing on is, you know, it doesn't matter whether we're working with large dairies, large beef feedlots, uh, hog confinement, uh, large poultry confinement operations. They have so many dollars invested in infrastructure. How do they pivot from that, move down the regenerative path, you know, get these animals more out on the landscape, uh, to start feeding uh, more diverse diets. Uh, we're starting to look not only, obviously, at soil health, water quality issues, but also animal welfare issues. And and how do we focus on the whole and all of these things when we're talking with uh, so many animals on such a small area? So that's what we're we've been spending quite a bit of time uh, uh, working on, and it's. It's not easy, I'll tell you that. But the good thing about it is we are making some headway. 
Yeah, I think that's really interesting perspective and, and a key challenge that you bring up about large ag and uh, how when you do make that investment in infrastructure, you're you're not incentivized to maybe innovate and do things that require pivoting how you think about things. So I think that that brings us to your background and how you discovered regenerative agriculture. And obviously, your story has been widely documented. I'm sure many of our listeners have have heard or read Dirt to Soil, but maybe walk us through a brief overview of what led you into agriculture and your your story there. Sure. So I did not grow up on a farm or ranch. I grew up in the city of Bismarck and I had a brother, older brother, who took vocational agriculture when he was in the ninth grade and he really liked it and encouraged me to to take that course and so I did and I was just hooked from day one. I was infatuated with all things production agriculture whether it be crops or livestock and I started working on farms in high school and then uh, married my high school sweetheart. I went to college to actually get a degree in vocational agriculture. I thought I was going to be an ag teacher and then uh, my wife's parents called one evening and asked if we'd be interested in moving back to the, the farm and taking it over, which we, I jumped at. I, I tell the story of my book, how my wife always says she married a city kid to get away from the farm, and then I drug her back to it. And she sometimes holds that against me to this day, but that's another story. Uh, so we started, I learned how to farm from my father-in-law, which was very conventional, heavy tillage and use of fertilizers and insecticides and those type of things. And then once we purchased the farm from them in 1991, we had the freedom to start making decisions. And one thing about me is I, I, I can't learn enough. And the more I know, the more I know I don't know. And so I'm always trying to learn new things. And I had read uh, uh, some work from Ellen Savory about rotational grazing and about holistic management. So we started to moving our cattle. I'd read about no-till, and so it just made sense to me. I sold all the tillage equipment, went 100% zero-till back in 1994. And then I tell people, then, then I really got blessed. I said, God, look down and picked the world's simplest farmer and decided to make an example out of him and blessed us with uh, two years of hail and then a year of drought and then another year of hail. And those four years, although they were extremely difficult to live through and and very difficult financially, uh, they were the best thing that could ever happen to me because the bank was no longer willing to loan us money. Now, we were fortunate that they didn't foreclose on us, but... I had to learn how can I get a profitable, productive farm and ranch without adding all of these inputs. And so uh, it really was a journey then of how do we take dirt uh, and turn it back into healthy, productive, living soil. And so that's the last uh, 25 years of my life has focused on that. And I would have never envisioned that it's grown to to where it's at today. And it's not just because of me. There were many others, such as David Brandt from Ohio, that were going down this journey at the same time. And now it's kind of all coming together. And we're seeing regenerative agriculture in in just about everything that has to do with farming and ranching. And, And I'm, I'm pleased to say we're seeing and the word regenerative uh, come, you know, all the way up onto the presidential debate stages. So it's a really good thing what's happened. Yeah, Gabe, thanks so much for sharing that backstory. It's an amazing, amazing journey that you've had throughout the course of your career and definitely encourage our listeners, if you haven't read Dirt to Soil, to definitely check it out to to get the full story there. And Gabe, maybe talk to us a little bit more about present day regenerative agriculture and kind of level set us with what you think is going well in the the regenerative movement today and what's still misunderstood in the space. We're finally starting to see the snowball roll downhill. We're 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 getting to the point when I say we, I mean those of us who are are directly involved in the promotion of regenerative agriculture. We're finally getting the education out there where farmers and ranchers are beginning to understand 
lending institutions are beginning to understand those uh, suppliers, whether it be fertilizer industry, chemi chemical industry, etc., are finally understanding more about soil health, about ecosystem function. And so we're coming together now. How do we move this forward? It's been very difficult up to this point because of a few reasons. Number one is fear. Uh, you know, it's, it's regenerative agriculture is a different way of looking at things than what most farmers and ranchers are used to. And so it's fear of the unknown. You know, why should they step uh, out of their comfort zone, so to speak? The other thing is, and I tell people this, the federal farm program is very antagonistic to, it, by and large, to regenerative agriculture. They do some things right, you know, the Natural Resource Conservation Service and some of the programs they offer do some things right. But by and large, most of the, the uh, farm programs are antagonistic to the regenerative movement. They just do not allow farmers and ranchers the ability to make the decisions that are necessary to move their operation forward in a regenerative manner. And so we've been working by that, through that, but the good thing is uh, this is truly a grassroots type effort. By that, I mean, uh, I don't know how it is out in California, but right now, throughout much of the uh, uh, United States in particular, uh, there's a real farm financial crisis going on out there. Just here a week ago, I talked to a lender in Kansas who said, uh, told me a full 25% of their clients will be denied operating loans this year. You know, that's how tight things are getting. Well, farmers and ranchers are realizing, hey, I can't just rely on the federal farm program. I got to go out there and I have to start doing those practices that can benefit the resource in a way where I can put more dollars in my pocket. So that's where the movement's at. We're, we're seeing more and more farmers and ranchers going down this path with or without the federal farm program. Gabe, you've been practicing regenerative for, for several decades now, well before it became this, this huge movement, popular and consumer awareness around it. What, what do you think is driving this tipping point right now? Obviously, like I said, it's been around, a lot of these practices have been around. Is it, is it consumer awareness and, and emphasis on, on climate change? What, what do you think is the, the key driver? Very good question. And I tell people this, uh, that there's nothing else out there right now that has the ability to bring all facets of society together, as does regenerative agriculture. If, you're, if your main uh, focus is on climate change, there is nothing that can be done to take massive amounts of CO2 and other gases out of the atmosphere and, and move them into soils uh, where they're in a cycle in the soil, as does regenerative agriculture. We can move more carbon than anything else through our practices. There's nothing else out there that has the ability to both give us clean water and to heal the water cycle to help us have the quantity of water that we need. You know, whether you're in California or Arizona or the desert southwest, you know, water is just a critical issue. If you're in the Great Lakes, it's water quality. If you're in the Chesapeake or the estuaries out on the, the west coast, water quality is critical. So if, if that's your main concern, regenerative agriculture can address those issues. If your main concern is human health, the nutrient density of our food, you know, we have a human health crisis, not only in this country, but all over the world. In the United States, we spend more on health care per capita than any other country. Yet, look at, look at what we have to show for that. The United States is at the top or near the top in ADHD, ADD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, obesity, cancer, osteoporosis, many other things. 
Now, are farmers and ranchers to blame for all of that? Of course not. However, the nutrient density of the food we're producing has declined precipitously over the past 50 plus years. Our farming practices are the reason for a lot of that. Regenerative agriculture has the ability to heal our soils and soil function, the water cycle, the mineral cycle, nutrient cycle, to the point that these plants are taking up nutrients, the plants are healthier, the plants then are able to be higher in all these plant secondary metabolite and tertiary compounds. Those in turn drive animal health and human health. Uh, we're involved in a couple studies right now where we're actually quantifying the nutrient densities of the products being produced on regenerative farms and ranches and comparing that to those produced under the quote unquote conventional production model. And what we've seen so far is just amazing. The difference is astounding and you can look forward to, to seeing more of that in the near future. But so, so the, what I'm saying is no matter what your concerns are, regenerative agriculture has the ability to address a lot of issues over a very, very broad scope. So it doesn't matter if you're a farmer and rancher, whether you're a business industry, whether you're a consumer, everybody can get on this regenerative uh, agriculture bandwagon, so to speak. And I tell people, we all can agree on 70 to 80% of these things. Let's work on those 70 to 80%. The, uh, the other you know, 20 to 30%, that'll work itself out over time. But let's get together and move forward for the betterment of society and our ecosystem. Yeah, those reasons are really what has resonated with us and why we're looking at our farming operation and moving down this path to transition to regenerative agriculture. And maybe talk us through your approach when you're analyzing new businesses that are looking to go down this path. What are some early steps that they can take to start their transition? Sure. So my business partners and I, Ray Archuleta, Dr. Alan Williams, and Shane New, we formed a company called Understanding Ag, LLC. And the purpose of Understanding Ag is to restore farm profitability, to heal our water, mineral, nutrient cycles, and our ecosystems, and do it in a way that regenerates these systems so that future generations can have the opportunity to be both profitable and sustainable. And so when we, when we go on a farm or a ranch to consult, what we look for, first of all, we do more listening than anything because it's about context. You know, my book is already outdated. I, I hate to tell people that because I'm still trying to sell some copies, but, but we talk about five principles in there. There's a sixth principle we's, we've added since I wrote that book. And that sixth principle is context. And we really saw as we traveled around the world consulting on farms, ranches, and for businesses that there was way too many people that were farming and ranching out of context. And I'll give you an example of that. For instance, I was in northern Alberta. I mean, we're talking uh, fly into Edmonton and then drive for six hours north. And they were trying to grow soybeans up there. I mean, that's farming out of context. You know, we were in eastern Colorado, very arid, dry environment, and they're trying to grow corn there. That's that's farming out of context. And I tell people I, I ranched out of context for years. I mean, here I am in North Dakota, you know, and I'm trying to calve in North Dakota in January and February. You talk about being out of context. That's out of context. You know, no animal should be born when it's 20 to 30 degrees below zero, you know, that, that's just out of context. So we come on a farm and ranch, we listen, we, we understand and learn about that operations context. What do they have there? What are, you know, what's their ecological context, their historical ecological context? What was there prior to European settlement? What did the landscape look like? What was the water cycle like? And then what are they doing now today? Is it in that context or not? And if not, how do we restore the function of that soil and get them back in context? The other thing we do is we do proper 
analysis of ecosystem health. Uh, it absolutely amazes us how many farmers out there are just over applying the amount of nutrients they are, whether it's synthetic or not. Doesn't matter whether you're organic or not, because we're seeing an over application of organic nutrients also. So we do proper soil testing and we find out, okay, how much biological life's in the soil, how much nutrients are being cycled, can be cycled, and then we start working for there, from there. There's a real misconception out there in agriculture that if you're going to go down the regenerative path, you got to go through some years of lower or less profitability. And that's just not true. You know, we consider it a failure if we don't increase profitability for our clients the very first year. And we do that through just what I said, proper soil testing, proper use of nutrients and inputs, and then build back the soil function and ecosystem from there. Yeah, I think that's super helpful. And I love that sixth point um, of knowing your context. I think that's that's really important. And that's obviously where your your firm fits in and helps people work through their specific context. So on that note, being a little greedy here, because this is this is our podcast, I uh, want to talk a little bit about vegetables and regenerative at scale. I think that's been one thing. We've had a lot of people talk regenerative on the podcast before and something that everyone's really working through is, you know, there there are some farms that are doing this, you know, very on a small scale micro um, level doing, you know, one to one to two acres. Um, and then there's more higher production agriculture in in the Midwest and and crops there. How how does this work? Um, maybe at a bigger scale, more than the one to five acres, uh, to really to really scale it. What are some some things that you would think through? The principles are the same. No matter no matter if you're one acre or ten thousand acres or a hundred thousand acres. Uh, we have clients over a million acres. You know, there, there are farms and ranches. So it can be done to any scale. The principles are the same. Now, obviously, the equipment and that that you use are a bit different. Obviously, with the, with smaller scale, an acre or so, you're going to do some more hand mulching, things like that. When you get into the larger scales, like like the ranch that, that we own and my son operates, it's 5,000 acres. Okay, what we use for mulching is cover crops. We use cover crops as the mulch instead of hand applying mulch. So the principles are the same. It's just the tools are a little different. As I tell people, you know, I, I have a, I'm just blessed. I'm on hundreds of farms and ranches all over the world every year. And I'm not 99.9% .9 confident I can get these principles to work on any farm or ranch. I'm 100% confident. Because these principles are the same. They're universal worldwide, wherever there's soil. So we just start working down the principles, you know. Okay, how much soil disturbance is there? Is there armor on the soil? How much diversity do we have? Do we have a living root in the soil as long as possible throughout the year? And if possible, are we integrating livestock? Now, some uh, production models do not allow the integration of livestock, for instance, Vegetables in California do not allow it, but do we have the pollinator and predator strips there? Just because we're not able to integrate livestock, do we have the home for all the beneficial insects? Do we have a home for all the predator insects that are going to eat any pests? We can still apply those principles. Yeah, we're definitely looking forward to seeing those principles applied on, on our farm and kind of navigating how we incorporate this at scale in our operations. Would love to kind of switch gears here and talk a little bit about branding and marketing. Maybe talk to us a little bit about how you get your products to market and what you've found is the best approaches there. Sure. And uh, I tell people um, our son Paul deserves all the credit for that. Uh, back when Paul graduated uh, from college in 2010, uh, uh, came back to the, the ranch, he made it very apparent that he thought uh, direct marketing was the way to go to capture more of the food dollar. And he said, Dad, we're producing a superior product due to our soil health. 
an ecosystem function. We need to take advantage of that. And we need to offer those products to to the consumer. And so his uh, uh, trademark uh, brand is Nourished by Nature. He trademarked that, that logo. And he's using a system, uh, Gray's Cart, uh, which is an online uh, system uh, for selling the product. He's developed over 130 different products now, beef, lamb, pork, chicken, eggs, honey, turkeys. I'm probably missing a few in there. Uh, but 130 products there where people can go online and shop. And then throughout North Dakota, he does both uh, uh, deliveries with drop points uh, where people can pick up their products or he ships direct. And that's becoming more and more of a player. I just saw one study that where they predicted that by the year 2025, a full 25 percent of the food purchased in the United States would be delivered directly to people's doors, doorstep. So uh, what I tell people as we go out and speak, you know, are you prepared for this? And here we are in North Dakota, you know, the whole state only has 730,000 people. And people think, well, they can't do it there. Well, we're doing it in North Dakota. If we can do it here, people can do it anywhere. You know, it's really not that difficult. Uh, we have customers in California. Now, in saying that, I'd love to sell everything local just to save on fossil fuel usage, et cetera. But at the same token, if people uh, want to buy our products, uh, we'll, we'll certainly accommodate them. Gabe, what about the company journey have you found to be the most surprising or unexpected? The most surprising thing on this journey has been that we're one of the few companies, Nourished by Nature, that's actually testing our products for nutrient density. We're spending the money to test our products. And as we go out and network with others in who are selling uh, farm-grown products, whether it be a pastured protein or whether it be eggs or whether it be vegetables, it absolutely surprises us how few have actually tested their products for nutrient density. We all like to say, oh, our product's healthier. But is it? Have you tested it? And that's been a real surprise to us. And just this past uh, uh, Thursday, my son and I met with Dr. Scott Kronberg, Dr. Fred Provenza, and Dr. Stefan Van Vliet is with the uh, Duke University School of Medicine. And it's the uh, Stedman Nutrition and Metabolism Center. Dr. Van Vliet uses mass spectrometers to determine all of these compounds, and it's well over 2,000 compounds that they've been able to identify. And these are compounds that are, in a lot of them, are directly related to human health and, and can benefit human health. And so it's, it's expensive to get product tested there, but we really feel that if regenerative agriculture is going to move forward, we need to prove that our product is truly nutrient dense. They're comparing, for instance, the Impossible Burger against a grass finished beef burger. And I'll just say this the differences were absolutely astounding. You know, the differences in those products. And, and, and I think those of us who are involved in agriculture, you know, we need to be hold our feet to the fire. And are we truly producing nutrient-dense products? If not, then we can't say we're feeding the world, right? We hear this over and over from farmers and ranchers. Oh, I feed the world. And my question to them is, oh, really, do you? You know, do you? Okay. Well, if you do, you better be concerned about the nutrient density of the product that you're producing, right? And you better do what's necessary, what you can do to ensure that product 
truly is nutrient dense. No, I totally agree. And I think we really, really like the outcomes based approach getting into the nutrient density as opposed to to certification on the on the front end. That makes a lot of sense as a as a point of dif- differentiation. Gabe, maybe talk to us about your focus over the next 12 months for the business. A year from now, what does success look like for you? Well, success for, for Nourish by Nature, our goal is actually to further shrink our footprint, you know, our carbon footprint, fossil fuel usage, etc. We're one of the few probably farmer ranchers out there who have been shrinking the size of our operation. By that, I mean in land base. We're stacking more enterprises. I see that uh, continuing. I see uh, Paul being really focused on how do we be the most cost effective to deliver a high quality product with the lowest carbon footprint. As far as the the next year for understanding ag, uh, that is uh, <laughs> the the car the, the cart is ahead of the horse on that one a bit in the fact that that regenerative ag is just expanding by leaps and bounds. And we're getting calls daily, multiple calls daily for our services. And a lot of those are coming from businesses that want to move down the regenerative path. You know, uh, it was just announced here recently. We signed a very large deal with General Mills to work with some of their, uh, throughout their supply chain to move that into a more regenerative manner. And we're seeing other businesses want to do that also. And that's exciting because if we can change all the supply chain, all, you know, from the soil health level, the the producer on up all the way to the consumer, that's a good thing. That's awesome. I think what you, you've done in the space has, has been really special and you've really propelled the movement. So we're excited to see that continue to happen and see you know partners across the board continue to, to push this forward. Well, Gabe, as we move to the next section we call Quick Takes, what is your favorite business book and why? I'm going to mention a book here that maybe some don't think of as business, but it's the Go-Giver series. Uh, It's my absolute favorite because I think, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I really believe that. People ask me, Gabe, how can you spend so much time answering emails and phone calls? And, you know, they call me out of the blue. I said, I'm really blessed. You know, God showed me the way and how to do this. And I just want to share. And I think the Go-Givers book series uh, really summed that up well. What are you spending too much money on right now? Uh, from the ranch's standpoint, it's it's probably on land rent, and that's why we're focusing on downsizing our uh, the the size of our operation and stacking enterprises instead. So, I would say that uh, that would be it right now from a business standpoint. What are you not spending enough on? Probably hunting and fishing. <laughs> Gabe doesn't take much time off. I tell people I love to hunt and fish, but uh, last time I crawled in a tree stand was 2007. So it's been a while. <laughs> Hopefully you can uh, free up some more time in the coming year to, to get some more, get some of that in. I hope so. <laughs> Gabe, what issue or trend do you find most compelling in agriculture today? What really drives us, besides what I talked about up front, is we're working with these large confinement operations, livestock operations. We're also seeing a, a gross over-application of nutrients. It was really interesting. We did some work on 45 farms uh, throughout the northern plains here into Canada, and we did what was called total nutrient extraction, where we extracted Uh, all the nutrients in the top 12 inches of the soil profile. What we found, this is on 45 farms, the average pounds of nitrogen per acre on those 45 pounds farms was 9,000 pounds. Average phosphorus level, 2,300 pounds. Average potassium level, 11,000 pounds. Now that's enough to farm for decades without adding any, but obviously they don't have the biology to cycle those nutrients. So 
that's one of the most compelling things I see is how do we really um, educate farmers, ranchers, industry that, hey, you have what you need there already. Let's, what you're lacking is the biology. Let's educate and move our farms, ranchers forward so that we can have a sustainable system. Gabe, this has been so, so helpful, so insightful. We've really appreciated the time and just are super thankful for everything you've done within the regenerative ag space. And we're excited to, to be a part of it going forward and, and see what you guys continue to do. As we wrap up here, how can our listeners get in touch and connect with you and Understanding Ag? Sure. So uh, they can Google understandingag.com. Or we have a 501c3 nonprofit educational wing, that's Soil Health Academy, and that's SoilHealthAcademy.org. Tim, listening to Gabe gets me super excited about what we're up to at Nuss Farms and just gets me re-energized about why we're doing what we're doing and, and transitioning to regenerative ag and figuring out all the complexities and challenges that come with that. But it, it's fun that this year, not only are we starting our transition, but we're also offering produce available directly to customers all over the country through Fruit Stand. Yeah, definitely. This is uh, we're kind of wrapping up the the final weeks of our harvest with the row seven squash that we grew this year. So, um, for those of you that haven't tried it or would like to give it a try, um, it'll be available for another week or so. So definitely go to fruitstand.com and check out the squash box. Yeah, guys, this is your last chance. Um, I think we'll be bringing the squash box back. Fingers crossed next year, but last chance to go online and get some Nuss Farms squash dr- shipped directly to your door. That would definitely be the biggest Christmas present you could get, Tim, is, is getting a squash box for your family to enjoy. It's the perfect time for the holidays. You can cook it during Christmas. Oh, come on, guys. You got to love a squash box just because it's so versatile. I keep seeing these lists of like the top gifts for her, top gifts for him, stocking stuffers. I feel like the squash box checks all of those boxes, Ty. Oh, and you bring up a really good point, Tim. Um, the 898 squash is just the, the perfect little size. And you could honestly, so cute. you can get a squash box. There's three to four 898s in each box. I think we're pretty much doing four in every box. And you can just slip one of each of those into your kid's stockings. So in addition to, you know, their, their toothbrushes and toothpaste, that's what our mom always gave. You can just throw in a, a little handheld squash. The kids will love it. Kids will love just getting a surprise by just a little cute baby baby squash. <laughs> but in all seriousness, we'll leave the link in the show notes. We It would mean a ton. Last chance for this year. Uh, check it out, guys. We will see you next week for episode 150. 